Is there? Okay, welcome ladies and gentlemen of the media. Today we have in our presence our presidential candidate, Mr. Kamrat Ramjitan, our prime ministerial candidate, Mrs. Sheila Holder, our hinterland coordinator, Mr. Martin Chuck. AFC's youth leader, Mr. Ivan Bentham, and Dr. Kamal Roy Narain, who is from Leg One, and he's an NEC member of Science for Change, and he will be making a statement on behalf of um, his work in Leg One. So, before, before the... All right, thank you very much. I will start off with the first item here in the media release Incompetence of the Ghana. Prison service once again highlighted. The Alliance for Change is once again alarmed by the incompetence of the Ghana Prison Service. Once again, there has been a prison breach whereby four special watch inmates of the New Amsterdam prison at 2 30 hours on June 12, 2011, escaped from the facility. The AFC submits that such breaches endanger the very important deliverable of public security. The AFC calls, recalls that the 2002 prison break in Georgetown ignited an unprecedented crime wave which threatened the core of our social, economic, and political stability. One would have thought after the consequences of this 2002 Camp Street breakout, the most stringent of security mechanisms would have been effected. The evidence associated with this latest New Amsterdam breakout indicates that clearly this was not the case. The AFC expects that a speedy investigation of this unpardonable lapse by the prison authorities will be conducted and that punitive measures will be taken against those guilty of dereliction of duty. The AFC expects a surgical joint services operation aimed at the swift recapture of the escapees should be able to achieve its goal. The AFC recalls that the findings of the Discipline Forces Commission report, which are still largely unimplemented, recommended that adequate monitoring devices and warning technology should be installed or upgraded in prisons such as Georgetown, New Amsterdam, and Mazaruni to enhance their physical security capacity and capability. Also, the commission recommended that in addition to monitoring devices, warning technologies, and appropriate firepower, there should be periodic checks of prisoners and prisons for weapons, implements for breaking, and other unauthorized items." Unquote. The AFC believes that the work of our disciplined forces will have to be enhanced by a comprehensive overhaul as recommended by the Disciplined Forces Commission report. I'll read the one on preserving Guyana's territorial sovereignty. The Lines for Change notes with concern that Suriname's President Desi Bautizé has recently reiterated Suriname's worthless claim to Guyana's new river triangle. According to media reports, Bautista is quoted as saying to Suriname's parliament that his country will be pursuing actions based on international laws to explore the possibility of the issue being handled by means of a friendly settlement. The FC here issues as condemnation of what it views as aggressive posturing on Guyana's legitimate territory. The New River Zone is estimated to be about 6,000 square miles an area that is much larger than Puerto Rico. It is located in the southeast of the country, in the Amuku Akarai Highlands, Highlands, which form the watershed boundary between Guyana and Brazil. The terrain is rugged, a maze of steep-sided slopes, narrow valleys, and numerous hills and ridges with heights up to 300 meters. High temperatures and heavy rainfall sustain dense rainforests with a thick canopy and tangled undergrowth. The zone is drained by several tributaries to the New River, which flows in a north-northeast direction into the Quarantine River. A mixed commission established by the governments of Brazil, Great Britain, and the Netherlands in 1939 conferred the New River Zone completely to Guyana. Since that time, international maps have been drawn on the basis of that agreement. In addition, Ghana always exercised sovereignty over the zone by granting licenses and concessions to black leaders and woodcutters. From the colonial era, 
Government geological expeditions have conducted surveys. Arrangers from the departments of agriculture and lands and mines have patrolled the zone to enforce regulations. Suriname's quest for new sources of hydroelectric power led it to conduct hydrographic surveys deep within Guyana, where it was calculated that the volume of water flowing from the new river was greater than that of the current river. Largely on that basis, Suriname simply passed a resolution in the parliament, thereby inventing a fictional frontier by changing the name of the new river to the upper quarantine and laying the claim to it in the year 1965, one year before Guyana's independence. The Alliance for Change recalls that in 1969, Operation Climax, affected by a task force of the Guyana Defense Force, destroyed an illegal Surinamese base in the New River Zone. An AFC government was fervently upholding an alliance allegiance. and allegiance to the sanctity of Guyana's territorial sovereignty. Towards this trust, the AFC believes that the Ministry of Foreign Affairs needs to be fundamentally strengthened. Some measures relevantly adumbrated in the AFC action plan include one, establishing a permanent parliamentary foreign policy committee. Two, resuscitating the Foreign Policy Institute with closer collaborations with the University of Ghana and with the University of the West Indies to serve as a training center for diplomats at the Research Institute. Three, strengthening the Coast Guard by properly equipping same with littoral combat and patrol ships. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen of the media. I will address the issue of the AFC's visit to Region 9. Eight. Region 8, sorry. A team comprising the AFC's presidential and prime ministerial candidates, Kemra Dramjatan, MP, and Sheila Holder, MP, Hinterland Coordinator Martin Chung, and NEC member Pradeep Bachan, visited Paramakatoi Village in the Pakaraimas, Region 8, last Sunday and Monday. June 12, June 12 and 13, respectively. They held a public meeting with villagers, paid a visit to the boys and girls' dorms of the boarding school, and listened to the concerns of villagers. Here are some here are samples of the issues raised with them and what they found. That the boundary demarcation exercise of traditional Armenian lands remains a burning issue among the villagers. The team listened to their concerns and undertook to investigate them further. The Paramakatoi villagers told the team that their mother tongue was Patamuna and not English. Therefore, the consultation attempts made by agents of the LCDS, that's the Low Carbon Development Strategy initiated by the government, fell short of being meaning meaningful from their perspective that contrary to what the ministers of education and local government have been telling the National Assembly, the public procurement bidding system for construction contracts in Region 8 continues to put Armenian contractors at an unfair disadvantage, since only external contractors are being awarded contracts. The same obtains for the supply of produce for the school. No local farmers have been contracted even to supply provisions. That the design of the kitchen facilities for the boarding school is a health hazard for the staff and students who prepare meals. It also violates national building codes. The dorm kitchen has, has been on the staff for years, while payments for the current staff members are in arrears for several months. When one staff member inquired about the non-payment of his salary, he was fired by the regional executive officer of the region eight of region eight. This clearly indicates a need for regional administration to approach the people's problem with a more caring face. That because of insufficient furniture, a shift system has been introduced for the schools in Paramakatoi. This alleviated the problem to some extent, even though the students lost one hour per day of learning time. However, a consequent directive was issued to the schools 
by the regional authority that all classes be held simultaneously during the regular school hours. This has now caused students to be standing whilst being taught because there is no seating accommodation. This lack of accommodation is due to the ministries and regional authorities' lack of foresight. If thought was given to the rate of population growth within the community, satellite and other surrounding villages, this existing problem of accommodation for the students would not have existed. Parents are calling for this to be corrected. The team was shocked to discover that the pit latrines in the boys' school dormitory have been full to capacity and is in and is in an unsanitary condition for several months. The school cries for help to the regional education authority. Sorry, to the regional education authorities have gone ignored. While dozens of residents in Paramakatoi wait in vain for their application for board certificates to be fulfilled to allow them to register. Many applicants in the village have begun to receive several copies of their birth certificates while others receive none. This highlights the inability of GCOM and the General Registrar's Office to devise a system to prevent the disenfranchisement of thousands of Amerindians. Talk not to be supportive of the government and your, your press release that you have, have a few captions of photographs that we caught. Doesn't tell the real story, it's kind of blasting and black and white. But it's very, very... Uh, That's from the next An appalling situation. Yep. Pleased to inform that it will host the AFC Youth Open Night on Friday, June 17, 2011, at the Pegasus Hotel from 17 hours. The AFC Youth Committee Open Night seeks to bring together a diverse group of young Guyanese in an open atmosphere of harmony and mutual respect. It will provide a forum for young people to express their opinions, emotions, and concerns on the Guyanese society we live in today and allow them to be part of the solutions to the, to the issues. Ensuring that the views of our youths are heard and that their suggestions are considered are guiding principles of the Alliance for Change. This open night is a further commitment to these principles. The aim is to include young people in the conversation on the change that is vi vital for a new Guyana that can fulfill its promise be great, green, and beautiful. Solutions to escalating crime, rising unemployment, a falling education system, the merit of other problems and haunts us, sorry, the merit of other problems that haunts us daily must ensure contributions from our youth. The AFC Youth Open Night will, through its interactive sessions ensure that the cries of, for change from our youths are heard. The evening will feature affirmative groups and open mic discussions, giving young people the opportunity to articulate their opinions, ask questions, and seek clarifications. In addition, these will be performances by comedian Miranda Austin, Palestinian Diane Chapman, and members of the YFC Youth Committee. Present at this event will be our presidential candidate, Mr. Cameron Ramjitan, our prime ministerial candidate, Mr. Sheila Holder, and other leading members of the party's national executive. You are invited, you are invited to cover this event. Okay, okay we will now invite Dr. Narayan to say something on uh, Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, seems that uh, it was a, a late decision to, to get here from level one, we have to bring. But these are very 
issues that are of the great urgency that I show up to let you know the need for community level. Just the other day, in fact, it's going on to a month, we have a problem with the stelling. The steps of the stelling has fallen apart. I called the minister's office in several occasions. I was told that the stelling would be fixed shortly. On to now, there's no progress in having the stelling fixed. It's such a dangerous situation that the speedboat that use the, cell, the, the steps more than anything else are not able to take passengers on or discharge their passengers. They have to do it or, uh, from the seawall or from the other parts of the stelling. So there is an urgent, urgent need for that stelling, that's those stairs to be fixed. The other issue is that this is in, in correlation with the stelling to some extent. The hospital, for over a month and we don't have a doctor. We have a hospital that have close to about 20 beds. And any patient going to the hospital, conditions that are need the attention of a doctor, has to be transported off the island. Now, if the stelling is not fixed, how can we get these patients on? So in situation like that, since we do not have a regular ferry service, which is not a problem we have here. In fact, the last weekend, Saturday and Sunday, there was no service, no ferry service to the island. And on weekends, we have a lot of people that travel to the island. So these are just two of the issues. That one had a lot of problems. It seems that I was told by, by some people who visit me from the PNP that the PNC had wrote off leg one. I don't think the PP has even wrote us back on. We have a problem with the sea defense. The sea defense during the spring tide on areas on the island are always flooded. We were told that um, there are money in the budget to, uh, which was passed in March to fix some of these areas and nothing has been done so far. They are putting sandbags to fill the fix these holes. Now, the biggest question will come in October when we have uh, one of the highest spring. And I think that probably at that time the island might be really be ripped off because it might be gone. So it's important that the press please carry this issue so that people can see in the government the dire needs of these people living on the island. And as I said, there are many other issues and we're gonna to try to cover it from time to time dealing with that one. I, I returned from, I lived on the island. I was born there, grew up there. I spent 43 years abroad, I'm a remigrant, and I've invested heavily on the island because that's where I want to be. So I'm hoping that the press will come to leg one probably on the 30th, uh, which we hope to have a, a, a public meeting and some other issues. And I'm glad if the press can come that day to cover it, because we are at least hoping probably to do some picketing of the NDC and RDC as to what's going When are they going to start doing some of the things for the people in Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Lorraine, will I invite your question? Um, I want to say is the EFC prepared to take any legal action or support such um, as it relates to the slothful provision of source documents for registration? Say that again, source what? Source documents for registration. Is the EFC considering legal action or will it support any such thing? Yeah, ma'am. Um, but in terms of the legal action, we have not as yet um, considered any legal action whatsoever. I'll tell you that. That's the frank position we have at this stage. Um, we are hoping administratively uh, that it will be worked out and so that people can get their source documents. It might be a little too late at this stage. Uh, we can, there is legal. Lit well, litigation that could be instituted and the court can then order someone at this late stage or even later than the deadline to be registered. We know of that situation. But we haven't gotten any person right now who, you know, more or less have indicated to us that they would like to get registered even at this late stage so that we can take them out of the court to get a court order to get that person registered. Today, the cabinet secretary announced that uh, the access to information bill, government's access to information bill, be taken or should be taken to Parliament on Friday. I mean, I know there is also the yes, he has a motion or a motion before the house. Is, could that 
bill be introduced with the motion still under our paper? Well, what we have, in fact, standing in the name of the leader of this party, the Office of is indeed a bill. And that bill has been in the Parliament for what? For the entire Hi. duration of the Parliament, five years. Um, we'd be delighted to hear, we are delighted to hear the, the Freedom of Information legislation by the government. We'd like it to be made. We await uh, to have a look see, to ascertain to what extent it covers um, the genesis of Freedom of Information legislation and see how free it is indeed. Um, you know, many promises have been made in the past and not kept. It was only recently that I received uh, an email from the Commonwealth Human Rights Institute of India asking for an update, because they have been carrying articles worldwide about the situation here. And they're particularly enamored by the recent advent of uh, Nigeria that has passed successfully approved freedom of information legislation. So Guyana is on the radar internationally. So um, I expect that Dr. Longchamp is aware of that and intends to do something about it on Friday. We would like to do the comparison between what we have there laid in Parliament and the desks and what the government party will be coming with. Uh, we would love to have that comparison done. Uh, we feel that if it is going to be a piece of legislation that is on par with the very modern legislation that Mr. Chapman got from India, Jamaica, and Trinidad, those are the resource places that he called and uh, drafted his. That would be fine. Um, but on Friday, I would only believe the government and Dr. Roger Lancer when I see it on the desk when we appear there on Friday. What I'm asking is, does, do the standing orders preclude them introducing that bill? No, 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 the standing orders no. do not at all. Because there is no motion really. Mm. We have laid a bill, a private member's bill, and the government has indicated it will not support that bill. They're going to wait the arrival of their bill. Well, let's see on Friday whether that is right. I can tell you, it is not on the order paper, so it's not for debate. It hasn't even been laid as yet. So when he says um, on Friday, it will be available. As a supplemental. Well, it may be on a supplemental paper, certainly. But of course, I want to put this on the record, that once we are satisfied that it fulfills the objective of freedom of information that is uh, universal, we will support it. Uh, Marie Capital News. Uh, there are concerns about the AFC not being a part of a coalition. Could you say what's the party state of this? Thank you, Mark. Um, we are honored that the joint opposition parties believe that the Alliance for Change can bring value to their alliance. The second point I want to make to you is that the Alliance for Change envisages working with the joint opposition parliamentary parties electorally. But we stand fast to our position that we will not join the alliance. And the reasons for that are based on our principles and, st and strategies. Strategic as well as one of principles. Now if you go back to our methodology, which was printed in 2006, you will see since then we made it very clear and we asked our membership and the people of this country to hold us accountable to this, that we will form no pre-electoral alliances, but we will, however, work to form a government of national unity. We also made it very emphatic that we form this new movement to allow a critical mass of people from the two race-based political parties to gravitate to us to end racial politics, which has brought us to this sorry state of affairs that has given us bad governance, that has allowed governments to be as corrupt and indifferent to the needs of the people. We believe that we have an obligation, spiritual as well as physical, to hold fast to our position. We take the position that if we join with one race-based party against another, 
we simply make more permanent the racial prevalence in this society. We will, however, work after the elections to form a government of national unity with both elements, because we're talking about two major races. We are confident that we have, over the years, amassed sufficient support from both race-based parties to give us the confidence to stay where we are alone. We are confident that our membership, as well as our supporters, wants us to do that. Yeah, if I may also add here, we feel that lots more damage could be done to the People's Progressive Party as a matter of strategy if we maintain our independence from the PNC, whether it takes the form of job or whatever manner or form the PNC takes. I am one who believes that even if the PNC is going to take away its symbol and also its name, the masses of this country will still hold fast to the position that it is the PNC. And since in our last national conference and our prior to that national executive meeting, we have made the decision that we are not going to go with the PDP or the PNC in whatever form or shape. We feel that will be, but of course, a falling into a trap simply because there has been a reconfiguration of the PNC into something called job. And uh, that strategically can make us lose uh, votes, especially from people who are disenchanted with the PVP, but simply do not want to touch the PNC. And uh, that's the strategic um, aspects of the matter that um, we want to bring to your attention. Sheila has just mentioned the principal position. We came on the scene stating that these two parties have been the source of the ill. First innings have been played where we have been critical of both and asking the voters that once vote for them to vote for us. We do not see at this short state of time in the second innings simply to go join up with one of them. It will perpetuate race relations and I think the Alliance for Change will be very much discredited in the process. And to that extent, I feel we have to maintain our principle and our strategy because um, we want to end racial voting patterns and we feel that what we are doing are, are the first steps towards that ending of it. You know, what we keep hearing from this group is that to a certain extent, they know better than us. I, I, you know, no evidence has been presented that what they're calling for will indeed work. It is a belief on their part. And therefore, our belief has equal status. Because we know our membership, we know our supporters, and we know it will not work. It and will. there's a fundamental element here, Mark. It has to do with freedom of choice. If we, at the national level and of the national conference, have chosen not to enter into an arrangement with these two political entities, that choice must be respected. We must not be called spoilers and treasonable and whatever else we are being called today, simply because we are holding on to our choice. Those who would like to leave and want to go join up with Jop or whatever, the PVP back, that's all right. But Guyanese, man and woman, once registered, have that choice. And we are urging that that choice that we have taken be respected and we do not be um, tarnished and you know, called um, defamed as a result of it. it. It is not what politics, uh, the new kind of politics we want. And we see, quite frankly, that happening. A lot of people say, but we are playing big shot. We all don't want to join up. We all think we're going to win elections and all of that. But we have indicated since the last time, 2006, why it is that we are separate and independent. And those principles will be maintained here. But uh, could you say if the AFC have what it takes to more or less maintain their seats in Parliament and win other seats? I have indicated on the last press, last press conference that we are absolutely certain that we are going to do far better this time around than last time. Because we have maintained our principles, we have done the work in Parliament, we have done the work on the ground, 
And that is why indeed, the PNC especially wants us to join them. If you, and that is why also the PVP, in their attacks at the political level, have been doing so to the AFC more than any party. And that alone makes me very confident we are going to triple, and probably more than that, at minimum triple our seats in Parliament. Uh, what are the AFC views on the comments of Mr. Viber D'Souza that the AFC did not contact him um, relative to him and his attendance at the last convention? Uh, thank you very much for that question. 